Hi, everyone. Welcome to our penultimate meeting of the Open Textbook Network's Hub 101. If your microphone is on, can you please mute? I think we're picking up, um, picking up some, some sounds from someone there. Oh, maybe it was you, Elvis. Um, thank you. Open office. That's that for you. Open office <laughs> yeah. design will do it. Yeah. So this being our second to last meeting, that means two things. One, the obvious, our time together is drawing to a close. But as a friendly reminder, it doesn't have to mean goodbye. You can join the co-op and the previous speakers, Karen, Carla, Amanda, Corinne, and other people with experience publishing so that you do not have to continue going alone. We meet informally once a month with our colleagues at Scribe and um, offer ongoing support. The second thing that it means, that this is our second to last meeting, is that I would like you to please start reflecting on the experience so that you can share your feedback about our meetings. So um, thank you for sharing your feedback about the units and the curriculum. And if you haven't yet for units four and five, please do. Um, and I know most of you haven't had a chance yet because I've only seen about three responses posted. So. I really do read those. I really do incorporate um, your ideas and your feedback. So um, please let me know how the curriculum is going. And then when we meet for the last time next week, I will have a survey so that you can tell us how these meetings went. And I'm gonna float some ideas about what Pub 101 could look like in the spring. And I'd really like your feedback about some of those ideas and to solicit any ideas <clears throat> that you may have. Okay. So today's meeting and next week's meeting are really sort of a transition from thinking about project management, communicating with your author. None of those things stop, but we're just kind of shifting the focus a little bit in these meetings to think about production and publishing pathways and the different ways that you can get um, those stages done. So it's possible that many of you may have more questions than we can cover today. So as a reminder, we have a shared document so we can extend the conversation. And I noticed that Tonya Farrell at UNO already posted a question um, to kick us off. And so I'm going to just um, read it and address it myself. And then Elvis and Mike, as they're talking the rest of the meeting, they can address it as well. So Tonya's question was about the curriculum. She says, in the style guide section, it says this, quote, a style guide is also a key element to defining your imprint as a consistent style across multiple publications will ultimately define your publishing program's brand, end quote. Tonya says, I can see choosing just one style guide for all of our publications as a problem as faculty seem to be very attached to the citation style used in their discipline. Do you really just pick or encourage one for everyone? Tonya, both things are true. You're absolutely right. You would not want to um, wedge a faculty author into a particular style guide if it was not a fit for that person. And, you know, I don't see a lot of publishing programs that have one style guide in place as part of their imprint. This may be something mm, more typical for traditional publishers outside of library publishing, outside of open textbook publishing. So you raise an excellent point, and I think you're absolutely right. If there is room for sort of a default style guide, let's say your authors are looking for guidelines or um, you just kind of want a starting point, then selecting the same starting point, maybe Chicago Manual or AP, you know, can just be helpful um, in creating a look and feel. So those are my thoughts. Um, and before I turn things over to Elvis and Mike for their thoughts about that and so much more, um, we're going to kick things off with, yes, a poll. Um, we're focusing on editing and design today. So our poll is related to editing and design and I'm launching it now. The first question, how can you evaluate or vet if a textbook needs editing? Please select all that you think may apply. So this may be more of a quiz than a poll, but it's anonymous. So um, give it your best shot. Maybe if a chapter in the middle of the book looks to be poorly written or disorganized, that may signal that you need an editor. If you notice a lot of simple misspellings and punctuation errors, that could mean you need to edit. If your author knows English as a second language, that could be a signal. 
And if an author, author has published before, that may mean a book needs editing. I think you can select as many as you think apply. I don't think you have to choose just one in this poll, um, but just give it a shot. These are just some ideas. And then the second question in our poll, what might be the impact of a poorly edited textbook? Um, learners may be distracted by inconsistencies, misspellings and typographic errors may undermine credibility, none, it's cool, whatever, who cares about poorly edited things? Or it may be an opportunity for students to contribute to the, and then it gets cut off. I think that's supposed to say something like the production of the textbook, um, or maybe you guys can see it, I can't see it on my screen, but. Um, Karen, we can see it, but I think the first one is multiple choice, not multiple select. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Thanks, Joe. Do what you can. Pick your favorite. The one you think is most right. The one you think is most right. Okay, I'm going to end the poll and I'm going to share the results. And we're really just going to use this as a starting point for our conversation with Elvis, who's going to talk about all of these different things in his experience um, working with editors and editing. So today we're joined by two guests at Scribe. Uh, one guest, Elvis, is in Florida, where it's in the 80s. Our other guest, Michael, is in uh, Philadelphia, where it's in the 30s. Um, and they both work for Scribe. Elvis is a project manager and book developer. And after we hear from him, we're going to hear from Mike Miller, who goes by Mike or Michael, and he's a production manager at Scribe. And as I turn things over to Elvis, I'm just going to put a link to Scribe in the chat. As you guys know, Scribe is an OTN partner. We have been working with them for a couple years in the publishing cooperative. They've been involved in the production of a few open textbooks. And uh, if you're a member of the co-op, you can work with them to do different professional services with your uh, open textbook projects. So perhaps you want an editor or a proofreader, they can supply those services to you and we'll charge you for them, but the OTN is not involved in that. And you do not have to pay to access their services. The OTN has basically paid for that on your behalf. Um, and so you can work with them. Alrighty. I think that is it. Elvis, I'm going to turn it over to you. <laughs> okay. So, hi everyone. My name is Elvis. Um, you may hear some noise just in the background. We are in an open office, so and we are during business hours, so um, people are talking to clients and so on and so forth. So you might hear them in the background, but I'll try to um, minimize that as much as possible. So it, a good place to start would be with that question uh, that Tanya um, gave to us right from the beginning. Um, I think that what Karen said is sort of the correct opinion, right? When you're looking at it from the perspective of a traditional publisher, usually you'll have that one style guide, CMS, APA, um, you know, what, you know, AMA for uh, medical text. Um, you'll have that already decided beforehand and it's just that one sort of like, this is the style guide that's the Bible for us, right? This is the one that we go by, this is what we default to. Uh, but even in traditional publishing, there's allowances made for authors to have a preference. Like let's say they'll, they'll say the main text is uh, CMS, but you know, right. I wrote, I had my notes set up in APA and I'd like right. to keep them that way. And so all that is determined uh, by you guys, the institution. So uh, the reason that we recommend just consistency is that if you're building a publishing uh, program, um, it's, it's better to have already like this foundation of something that's already been established and it's the one thing that you can even sort of tell your authors like hey we go by this you know maybe gear your writing towards this style guide. so it really is um, up to you um, so hopefully that that feeds a little bit more into right. that, that answer um, so yeah so um, I'll just go briefly over the poll uh, and the questions that we ask so when we talk about evaluating or yeah, vetting yeah. Uh, a textbook uh, or any other kind of book. There are several things that we look at. Uh, so, for example, those uh, those questions, those answers uh, that we right. we gave you as possible options, all of them right. um, actually um, 
go into your thinking when you're evaluating a textbook. So for example, if you have an author who has English as a second language, you should strongly consider uh, having an editor look at it because they may have dominated uh, you know, English and it's not you know, a jab at your author or anything like that, but there are some things that uh, yeah. just slip in. Um, yeah. um, I can say that just from, from personal experience because uh, I, I'm I actually an I English as a second language uh, person. Right? My first language is Spanish. Uh, so, you know, even as an ESL person, you have to, you know, sometimes like really think about what you're writing and when you're yeah, writing under a deadline or anything like that, some things from your previous language might slip in. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. When you're, so all the other options, there are perfectly valuable reasons for you to consider having an editor um, as um, a second set of eyes on your, um, on your textbook. Um, and for the second question, what might the impact of a poorly edited textbook be? The, uh, the only wrong one is not it's cool because you know, a poorly edited book will have uh, you know, impacts on whether the person who's actually reading the book um, you know, sees a misspelling, sees something, they might actually, it might take away credibility away from the author, even though they might be experts in the field. Um, misspellings and typographical errors, uh, you know, um, may distract uh, learners from actually getting the point of what the author is trying to say. Um, and so um, you could also see that as an opportunity for, stu uh, for your students to take a look um, at, the, uh, at the textbook and actually contribute right. to uh, the production of it. So um, hopefully that covers uh, everything. I don't want to go too much into that. I just wanted have. to add one yeah. thing, Elvis. Sure, I just wanted to jump back to that first question. There was an mm -hmm. option there about whether um, editing was necessary or appropriate if an author yeah, had published done. before. Yeah. And uh, just to remind people that just because someone has published before doesn't mean that they can't make mistakes. Everyone can make mistakes and it's always valuable to have a second set of eyes uh, on your text no matter how experienced right. Uh, anyone is because um, uh, both Elvis and I do this sort of thing every day and we still make mistakes which is why we always have a second set of eyes on everything that we do so Correct. I wanted to point that out so according like just like Michael said like when we are looking at something we might be experts like Mike's uh, an expert in typesetter and designer you know and I might be an expert editor but even we have um, you know somebody over us to sort of QC yeah. our work, quality control, um, check our work, because anybody can make mistakes. So if an author has been published before, don't assume that their work is perfect um, off, you know, off the bat because of that. Um, you know, it's always good to take a look at your document and make sure that you know, the ideas are getting through um, as they need to. So, um, so yeah, so hopefully that covers um, everything in the poll. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Um, at this point, I think you can put them in the chat and uh, Mike and I and Karen can uh, address them as they come up. So, um, Scribe is a company that, um, it's a publishing services company. So we, uh, while we are not publishers ourselves, we provide publishing services. That means that we provide editing, design, typesetting, uh, ebook conversion, uh, proofreading, among other things. So we also specialize uh, in conversion of older text. So for example, if you have a textbook that is not set up in Word um, or anything else, and all you have is a hard copy. We also do um, what's called OCR work, which is where essentially we scan the, uh, the hard book, uh, the hard copy book, okay. and then um, transfer that to an electronic <coughs> format. And from there, um, apply <coughs> styles, um, make sure that you know the document is, um, is correct, and then we can edit and reproduce uh, the document there. So you uh, scribe started at the university. Pennsylvania um, as a research center um, called CCAT, stands for Center for Computer Analysis of Text. Um, and from there, um, okay. so we went that's and that's started that's adding that's other that's uh, services, becoming the business that we are today. So we added um, typesetting, then we added editorial services, um, and from then um, added other, um, other services as the ones that I mentioned. Yes, Karen. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're having a little trouble hearing you, and I don't know if, if you're in a position where you could ask your colleague to perhaps. <laughs> Let me try share, something. Share I might actually. <laughs> I can do something. 
um, that might improve it, but you'll lose my video. So okay. I don't have that many ports available. Well, so I, if I'll you give me a second, I will get that. Okay. Fixed. Thanks, Elvis. Not a problem. So um, let me try and pick up with what Elvis uh, would be covering uh, while he's taking care of that. Uh, the uh, uh, So uh, Scribe's work is based around the Wellform document workflow, um, which um, is uh, <clears throat> a Wellform document is a document that is um, tagged um, that is, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, formatted in a way that uh, the structure of the document and the rendering of the document are kept separate throughout the life of the document. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, structure is very simply, simply what job is each piece of text doing? Uh, and rendering is, okay, well, how does that look? So um, uh, let me share a screen here for a moment. Um, do, uh, can everyone see that? Uh, so this is the uh, well-formed document process and of course zoom is blocked it out on my screen so I can't even see what I'm showing you uh, there it is all right um, so it's a uh, rather regimented way that we have of uh, handling documents uh, we receive the manuscript from the author we, we do what we call this compose it which is we uh, style simple elements with scribe tools. So that's where we go through the document uh, paragraph by paragraph to identify what job each piece of text is doing. Is this the chapter title? Is this uh, a block quote from, brought in from another source? Uh, and Elvis actually has more detailed examples of this heat up on his system. Um, this is sort of just the very, um, this is the 35,000 feet overview of the process. Um, um, Thanks, Mike. I think Elvis yes. is back. I don't know, Elvis, oh, is do you want to? I am. Okay. I am. Can everybody hear me? Yes, that's better. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Is this much better? Yes. Yes. yes? Okay, good. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, technical dif difficulties. So it's recorded live. So there you go. Um, okay. So um, I lost audio when Michael started uh, speaking, so um, I'm not sure what was covered. So. Uh, I just uh, went over the very, very beginning basics of what uh, well-formed documents are and how we handle them. And I was sharing my screen about the uh, um, the the SML um, workflow. Workflow, yes. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. Good. So hopefully that preview is going to help you guys as we move along. Um, so where I left off, I'm not sure how much of, uh, thanks to the microphone, how much of what I said was heard, um, but um, just as a brief um, uh, sort of uh, summary, um, a scribe started at the University of Pennsylvania, and then we've been adding publishing services um, to our repertoire of, um, of services that we provide. Uh, we have two. We have three locations: one in Philadelphia, um, one down here in Florida, where I am, and one in Allentown, Pennsylvania, uh, which is uh, where um, Michael is. Our clients uh, vary from self-published authors to university presses to um, uh, Christian publishers um, and publishers uh, of um, some fiction, some academic monographs, um, and things like that. Um, as Karen mentioned, we've worked with the OTN. Uh, for the past two years, um, we've um, we've been working along with the different um, OTN um, members uh, to create several books, um, and um, a couple of them are already out. Uh, uh, specifically, the ones from Portland State University, and uh, we're currently working with Oregon uh, State University for just editing, which um, I'll talk a little bit more about that 
uh, later on, but um, our services, um, because they are so varied, are also, um, you can essentially choose which services you want us to provide. So while we can handle um, all of the project management, essentially you give us the manuscript and we can take it from there. Um, if you know it's more cost effective for you to handle uh, certain aspects like the typesetting, the design, or anything like that, uh, we, um, we can also work with you. Uh, in that regard, um, and just do, for example, just the editing or just the design, just the typesetting, um, or even just cover design if that's what you need. Um, we are very flexible with that. So we have people here who are of uh, different expertises um, or different expertise. Um, I, for one, um, am an expert in essentially um, theology, uh, Christian theology, and so on and so forth. Um, but I work as an editor here, so um, usually things that are of a biblical nature, um, you know, get handled um, by me here. But there are other people here who are experts in sciences, uh, the sciences, math, so on and so forth. So if you hand us a document and you um, say, hey, like, can do you have somebody who can like read this and, and really understand what's being said, uh, the chances are that we do, right? That will also be part of what we would call our vetting uh, process. Um, so essentially our philosophy here at Scribe is that we are always trying to produce a, a document that is not only going to last um, you know, beyond the use of a single program or anything like that. Like for example, um, now uh, most uh, publishers use InDesign, but we remember that there was a time before where uh, Quark was used. Um, and so a lot of, uh, if you essentially marry yourself to one program, once that program goes uh, the way of the dinosaur, you might find it a little bit difficult to get your document into, uh, you know, to do reprints or to uh, um, make second editions, or third editions, fourth editions, and so on and so forth. Um, so what we do is that we create what we call SCML, Scribe Markup Language, and that document serves as an archival document that you can keep uh, forever. Um, and because it's XML-based and it's well-formed, um, there are multiple ways that you can transform that into then uh, an InDesign file or um, whatever happens to come next. Um, are there any questions up to this point? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to to just dovetail with what I was saying with what mm -hmm. uh, Elvis and I were essentially saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, project that is well formed and and um, that structure and that rendering are kept separate. That is how we future proof our projects because the job that a piece of text does in a document is not going to change whether that document is typeset or whether that document is an ebook, whether that document is an audio file, whether that document is some sort of uh, format that has not been invented yet. The job that it needs to do, the information that it needs to convey to the reader uh, is going to remain consistent uh, as long as that, um, as long as there are humans that are going to read it, um, the job that that project is going to do is going to go better. And so, so when we are thinking of the, the documents that we're producing, because the textbook, book, everything boils down to, um, to that text, that content, uh, we want to not only uh, future-proof it, but we also want to make sure um, that you know, we can reproduce this in a way that's going to be accessible uh, to readers, which SCML um, and our eBooks are by default accessible. So um, there are a lot of options um, of what we can do for you, um, but through it all, we are always trying to, even if you just use us for editing, we are trying to provide for you um, essentially a service that's going to keep your, uh, your textbook, your manuscript, your monograph, whatever you may want to call it, in a, um, in a sort of future-proofed way. And so we provide editing services, as I mentioned before. We provide design services. So if you give us an idea of what you want your book to look like, we'll have essentially uh, a back and forth with you um, or even with the authors if that's uh, what's required to essentially get the book um, to look exactly how you want it to look. Uh, we provide typesetting services so we can apply that design to the actual content of, um, of your book. And we also provide uh, conversion services from um, anything from Word files all the way uh, to ebook. And usually when 
um, when we, you know, are working on um, converting something or something like that, we are always producing that SCML file so that way you always have that archivable file ready. Um, and one of the last things that we do is that we apply style. Um, we apply um, styles to uh, word files, which we call composition. Um, and that is so that we're essentially coding your file so that it can easily um, keep this information about what the content is. Um, so for example, um, if you type in to word, um, you know, a sentence and you want to italicize one word, if you copy and, and paste that sentence into a text editor, you lost the um, the italics uh, because Word is just displaying that. It's actually not coding for that. Um, we, when we compose a document, are actually making it very explicit that this uh, word that you've decided to italicize is italic so that your information is maintained throughout um, the entire process of uh, production and editing. Um, so I'm going to share. I think, Michael, you're still sharing. So, yep, there you go. I'm going to share a little screen, a little screen grab of what, it's a, essentially a version of what uh, Michael already shared with you that sort of showed like a linear way, like, hey, you know, you give us your manuscript and we will take it through all of this, um, you know, through all of our different processes and then, you know, you'll end up with your, uh, with your document, your PDF or whatever it might be. Um, you know, and that shows sort of like this one idea of the well-formed document workflow where like we can handle everything from the beginning. But if, for example, um, you just need us for editing services, you can actually come in to the well-formed document workflow uh, at any point and leave it at any point. That's why we've sort of designed it as, um, as a circle. So at any point in this, um, in this cycle, you can come in and you can say, hey, look, I've already edited this file. Uh, we don't need your editorial services, but we need your design services. Well, then you can come in and we would compose the um, compose the document because the composition is sort of part of everything that we do. Um, it's that early uh, important first step. And then we would um, go ahead and give it to somebody like Michael who will come up with some design samples and we'll go back and forth and decide what you like from each design sample and then come up with a final design. And at that point, if you say, great, we have the design, uh, we have our own in-house typesetter, we'll just give them this template, then you're welcome to do that. Um, and you're also welcome to say, well, you know what, you did you know, good job on the design, go ahead and typeset this for us. Um, so again, we are very flexible um, in that uh, respect. So it's not like you're buying into a system that is, hey, you have to go in from the beginning and then go all the way you know, to the end with the same system. So um, we do recommend though, and this is something that is just a general, um, how can I say, a general tip, a word of advice, um, that you should, when you're vetting your manuscripts and getting your projects ready, um, you should try to do as much of it in the beginning. We do that with our own workflow. That's why composition comes first before anything, um, because we want to get that coding and uh, set uh, into that uh, Word file. Um, long before we start editing, long before we design, and long before we start typesetting, because it really is the foundation of everything that we do. Um, so when you're thinking about your uh, project or your, or your book, you always want to try to deal with as much of the issues, um, as much of the things that like, for example, missing images and um, you know, what style guide's gonna be used and all this other stuff. You wanna deal with all of that right at the beginning. You wanna front load everything because it might seem like a lot more work to do that, but when you front load things, by the time you're at the production stage, um, there are a lot of less things that you have to work, that you have to worry about. So, um, for example, if you've already copy edited the, the manuscript and you're sure it's good to go and everything's great, by the time you get to an actual PDF, which is very difficult to, um, you know, apply changes to and then regenerate and do all this stuff, um, you won't have to go in and start saying, oh, I now need to change, you know, some editorial aspect of this and now my typesetting time is going to go through the roof uh, or my typesetting costs are going to go through the roof. Um, you won't have to deal with that because if you've front loaded everything, then now you don't have to worry about as many editorial issues or anything like that during a stage in the production of a book that 
is not as malleable as, for example, when the manuscript is still in um, the Word file. So I'll stop sharing here. Okay. Go ahead, uh, Michael. Oh, I just wanted to jump in and uh, point out that the um, um, the markup language that uh, we use, uh, the uh, uh, we call it the scribe markup language that um, that sort of vocabulary of uh, identifying what job everything does in a uh, in a book is not um, even though we keep control and manage uh, SCML it's not a secret what that um, is I'm going to put in the chat uh, a link to uh, the SCML list of all the paragraph styles and character styles that we have identified as um, uh, necessary that uh, we use every day in uh, marking up books and um, uh, a tool that uh, we have as a free tool um, is uh, at Microsoft Word add-in um, uh, we call it the SAI, which is a describe add-in for Microsoft Word. There's getting into the depths of how that work is a little beyond this uh, very introductory session, but I just wanted to put that there that people can follow up with uh, uh, Karen or Elvis or I about that stuff. So I just wanted to make sure everyone had that link. So I'm going to just um, sort of jump in because we're already at half an hour after the hour. Um, so to summarize what Mike and Elvis have been talking about, um, you can work with Scribe in a multitude of different flexible ways. They have been sharing with you their particular workflow, which we are happy to teach you if you want to learn it. It probably makes the most sense to learn it if you have multiple projects over multiple years. There is a learning curve, and so for one open textbook project, you probably would not want to learn the well-formed document workflow, but for many, if you're really thinking about ramping an operation up, it could be a good fit for you because it's a way to save costs if you work with Scribe on other services. If you don't want to use the well-formed document workflow, and let's say you have a backlog of manuscripts and you know that they need proofreading or copy editing, but you're going to publish those manuscripts in, let's say, Pressbooks. You can also work with Scribe, and I'd like to invite Stephanie, who's at Oregon State, to just say a couple words about how she's been doing that over the last few months. Thanks, Karen. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, we've been working with Scribe uh, for a couple of months now. We had a lot of, we had a fairly large backload of manuscripts that we needed to get finished before we send out our next RFP. So it has been um, really useful for us because our faculty want copy editing and I don't have anybody in-house to be able to, to provide that service. So Elvis is my main contact and he always sends me um, updates about where the manuscripts are uh, and questions that we can send back to the faculty author, um, uh, just kind of keeping in contact. So that's been really, really good. I think what, Elvis said earlier about front loading as much as possible is really important. Um, we will be doing more of that. We were just had to get these things off our plate. <clears throat> so they were probably in not the best shape that they could have been. Um, so hopefully that will, I would encourage people to, to go that route because it does take some time. And once things are done, um, you still have to go back and forth with the author a little bit and, and that kind of thing. So, but I think it's, it's been very helpful for us. I, I'm, one of my goals for this position is I want to up the quality of what we do and copy editing is really important to me, but it is not inexpensive. Mm -hmm. It's worth every penny, but it's not <laughs> inexpensive. I just want to say that. Yep. Thanks, Stephanie. And in the link that I put about Scribe, they have their sort of baseline rate that you can take a look at. And when you have a manuscript to send them, Elvis will look through it really carefully with um, a team, whoever may be involved, and be able to tell you here are the estimated costs for a manuscript so you're not going in wondering, what is this going to all add up to at the end? You will have that information up front. 
Paige also had a question about working with Scribe because um, she is at an institution that is a member of the OTN through a consortium. Now, a consortium can join the publishing cooperative. Paige, maybe it would make sense for you to be the person on the co-op Google group and joining in um, on co-op meetings. Um, the main thing is that there would need to be one project manager at a consortium who's funneling all of the institution work with Scribe. So um, there are some arrangements uh, with consortia that are already members of the co-op where someone at an institution has said, hey, I'll, I'll be that person, I'll do that work. Everyone you know, who's involved in the consortium says, great, thank you so much. Um, I don't think right now it's been like a deluge for anyone. Um, that maybe could be once you got really going, but there is an entry point there. I hope that that helps answer your question. Um, institutional members have that direct access to Scribe and consortial members still have access to Scribe. It's just that it's not every institution within the consortium contacting Scribe themselves. The, every institution within the consortium is funneling it through Page or someone else at the consortial level and they're working with Scribe. Um, so this is very similar to sort of the the train the trainer and your your general membership in the OTN. Okay, great, Paige, I'm glad that could answer your question. So um, as I feared, we are losing time. Um, I think Elvis, if you wanna just briefly touch on the difference between copy editing and proofreading, that would be really great um, for our members and then um, showing the OTN project. And then I would, st I hope that somebody out there um, did pick an instructional book that they really like and they might be willing to share it in just a couple minutes as we transition to Mike to talk about design. Yep. So I'll try to be quick but not too quick. As Karen knows, I can speak incredibly quickly and so that that, that won't help anybody. But um, I, will be, I, will, I will be brief. Um, so um, just briefly going over this, um, by the way, thank you, Stephanie. Um, I didn't know she was on the call. <laughs> um, so uh, we have been working with uh, um, uh, with Oregon State just to uh, sort of dovetail off of that. And they've actually contracted us just for copy editing. And as Stephanie said, yes, that is not the most inexpensive thing uh, that we provide. But um, as she said, it is worth every penny because if, it, if we're able to get a, ma a manuscript um, in tip-top shape during copy editing, um, a lot of things go a whole lot easier uh, later on. Um, so, uh, the differences between copy editing and proofreading is that copy editing takes place not only in Word, but it's also more in depth. Um, there is more of an opportunity to make changes, um, and we are trying to essentially mold the uh, document into the very best version according to whatever the style guide that the institution dictates. Proofreading, on the other hand, usually takes place uh, by the time that the book has already been typeset. And at that point, you're looking for very light, like spelling errors, uh, things that are just inconsistent or things that are very, um, that are unclear for a reader. So um, it essentially is a difference between, um, you know, something in depth that happens at this front loaded uh, stage versus something that happens um, towards the end of uh, production. So. Um, yeah, so hopefully, um, hopefully that's that brief descriptor is enough to sort of give you a taste of the difference. There are, there are many things that we can just go into details, but we won't do that, um, do that here. And the, just to take off from there, uh, even with copy editing, there are levels of editing. Uh, so for example, we here at Scribe use light, medium, and heavy, um, and each of them is successively, just as their namesake says, um, essentially, um, going through and editing um, the document in such a way that it's, how can I put it? It's a light edit is essentially similar to a proofread, a little bit more in depth, but it's along those, along those lines. Um, and then medium involves more sort of working with um, things, fixing things for sense and things like that. And then heavy is really, you know, getting into the document and, you know, providing feedback to the author and, and querying and so on. And there's a, a higher level called developmental editing where the editor works directly with the author to sort of get the document to their best, uh, into the best shape that it can. So there are different things that you can choose. And, um, you know, depending on how you 
evaluate your document. Um, you can tell us, hey, you know, I just want you to check for this, this, and this. That's great. Um, for example, with Stephanie, one of the one of the uh, files that she sent us, we told her, hey, we're noticing these, these, and, th and these things. You know, it would bump this up to a medium level edit rather than a light. And she told us, no, just leave it as light. We'll handle this on our end, and that's what we do. So um, that's sort of those are your options there when it comes to to editing. Um, I believe Mike is going to share. Um, some of this, but I have the editing file. So I'll at least show this part really quickly um, and then hand it over to Mike. Uh, let me just share. Just so you have an idea of what we, what we do when we edit, this is um, a sample chapter from a book from um, uh, Portland State. Um, essentially, um, it's a I believe psychology book uh, that we edited. This is how we received the book. They actually did the composition on their own uh, because they were part of the co-op. So they decided to take that um, responsibility. So you'll see uh, that the document looks pretty well put together. Um, although if you send us a document that doesn't have, um, you know, that doesn't have any styles or anything like that, that's perfectly fine. We can apply those styles. So as you see, this is what we received. After we looked at this and vetted it, we determined, okay, this is going to be a light edit, so um, we're going to get started. So at this point, there we go. We went through and we read through the document, and you can see, already see that we uh, employ track changes, so that way when we are done with our edit and it's been QC by somebody in-house, again, uh, quality control checked, um, then this would go to the author, um, and the author would have a chance to review all of our changes. So that way, it's never like the author is left out of their out of their book once it's in your hands. Like they are uh, very much involved. So we use our uh, track changes, and you can see that we uh, employ certain things like here. Uh, CMS dictates that whenever you use uh, percents, um, you use numerals, uh, not written out words. So we've gone ahead and changed that. And so as you see, we go through. Some composition has, some cleanup has gone on here. Um, so that's why you see that the file's a little different. Uh, the view is also a little different. Um, so you'll see that there are certain things that we changed, like for example, commas before um, uh, intro, um, conjunctions that introduce sentences. We remove those or comes afterward, excuse me. So things that we changed just for sense, you know, what known, we change it to what was then known and so on and so forth. So this would go to the author and we would also leave comments as you see here. Um, like for example, we notice, hey, this sentence is hanging out by itself. Should it be changed? So in certain instances, especially with light edits, we don't make these types of changes. We just send it as a query back to the, uh, to the author. So we'll close out of that. And then this is what we got back from the author. So you'll see that they left alone any changes that we made. But I'll actually just show you quickly. I'm not going to go into details. But if we go and we can see that the author has gone through and added certain things, it's like, okay, I want tabs here. That question that we asked earlier says, okay, no, I have to change this. So you know, he's gone ahead and made those changes and you can see that there's changes in the file. So what we would then do is we go through the file, accept all of our changes, and then go through each of the author's individual changes uh, to make sure that uh, they're not introducing any errors and that it makes sense in general. And finally, you would have this accepted file, which is the file that would go um, to uh, design if it hasn't if the document hasn't been designed yet or would go to typesetting if you already have a template So you see we've accepted all the changes we've gone through and at this stage this document is um, wholly different from what we originally uh, Received and that's just a brief overview of what we do uh, When we edit a document, so I think now I'll pass it over to Mike Who has this next part? Uh, okay um uh, let me do the screen sharing. It's, I don't actually have the same book that, um, mm -hmm. that Elvis uh, was sharing, but I just want to talk very briefly about the importance of design and typography in getting your message across. Uh, 
A statistic that's sort of thrown around all over the place is that when you're talking to someone, 93% of the messages that you're, the, the communication that you're doing is nonverbal. It's not the words you're saying, it's how you're saying them. It's your body language, it's your tone of voice. Typography in written communication is your body language, is your tone of voice. Uh, it tells your reader how to regard the information that you're sending. It tells them how to slot it into their brain. Okay. It, um, this uh, screen that I'm sharing, um, is the screen share working? Um, yeah. So um, we can see that uh, where our chapter title is. Uh, this is the second lesson that this is all going to be about what makes air hot. Um, and then we have these A heads that are large and red. The A level heads just mean that they're top level heads. This teacher background knowledge is a B head. It's the second level down. It creates a visual hierarchy so that your reader knows, just like if they're following an outline, what the most important topics are and what are subtopics of those topics so they know how to understand the information that you are trying to convey um, let me uh, page through very briefly. Um, the uh, making a design that is uh, aesthetically unified um, both uh, speaks to your credibility and the author's credibility. Uh, it makes everything look as though it has been planned out because it has been planned out. Um, and it um, it, um, yeah, it conveys what is important and what is not important uh, by, like I said, it functions as the body language and tone of voice of your text. Uh, I can't get much, one of the, the things you will learn if you delve into the realm of d design and typography is it's difficult to know a little uh, you sort of have to know all of it at once in order for all of it to make sense. Um, like uh, we have this here that's a sidebar. We have here that's a different sort of sidebar. In this particular book, um, there are safety instructions because there are um, lab in, uh, experiments that students are going to have to do. So safety instructions are important to call out. We have the uh, red border and the exclamation point to let everyone know that this is very important and needs to be uh, taken uh, seriously every single time. Uh, so, um, like I said, I don't want to get too deep in typography because I will just talk about it for hours and hours. Uh, we don't have time. So I'm going to throw it back to Karen uh, to take uh, questions or follow up. Great. Thanks, Mike. Can you leave that up actually? Um, because I would like to connect what you're looking at on Mike's screen with the first unit when we talked about structure and elements and what makes a textbook a textbook and how it's different from a monograph. So all of these elements that we're looking at, the color, the different sidebars that Mike just pointed out, the typography um, when bold is used, uh, the photos that we see here, um, all of those things are what make a textbook a textbook. And so in the margins where you can see the labels in red, um, like sidebar one, um, where Mike is hovering and highlighting with this cursor, that is part of the learning process in terms of structuring a book if you were to learn Scribe's process. Um, for example, Elvis was talking about Portland State and the philosophy textbook that they published. Karen Bjork there learned um, this process of, of I'm going to use some crude terminology that I knew no scribe doesn't love, but um, of labeling or tagging consistent elements in the manuscript so that, you know, they, every time they appear throughout the entire manuscript, throughout the entire textbook, they're treated the same. And it communicates to Mike and other designers, hey, this is this type of thing. So it's always going to have a red box with an exclamation point around it because we really want to make sure that students know. So thank you, Mike, for walking us through design. And, and I love the uh, metaphor in terms of body language um, and nonverbal communication. I think that that's really great. So um, we have 10 minutes remaining. And I want to acknowledge that we ran out of time in terms of sharing your examples of good design. But I hope 
if you did do that homework exercise and you went looking for something that you found inspiring in terms of instructional design in print, that um, you're able to connect and apply that to this conversation today. So there's a few questions in the chat, um, but I also invite you to unmute if you would like to ask Mike and Elvis anything about their process or what it's like to work with them or even um, something about their experience working um, in publishing more broadly. This is your time with them. Um, let's see, is there anything outstanding in the chat? Okay, looks like, uh, looks like Ellie's had all of her questions answered in the chat. Um, does anyone have questions about kind of the different ways to, to work with Scribe, or does anyone have broader questions about editing, design, vetting a manuscript, um, what to do if maybe you don't have the budget to work with Scribe, but you feel like, I have some confidence in reading and writing and reviewing, are there tricks I can use to try and you know, be a second set of eyes, which we know is so valuable in the manuscript? Um, let us know. I feel like somebody unmuted, but I can't actually hear a voice. I hear air. Oh, I think that's me. Oh. Just in case somebody <laughs> asked a question. Okay. Oh, Larry is asking, if someone creates a book using Adobe Creative Cloud, how will the finished book be available in various formats? That's a good question. And I think um, both Mike and I can sort of tag team that one. Um, so um, if you're using the Creative Suite, so essentially InDesign, um, you can essentially have a PDF, um, but if you give us the InDesign files, uh, we can also from there go into SCML and generate HTML, generate an EPUB, generate a Mobi, um, and depending on what your needs are, um, if it's something that we, like for example, don't do, like for example, we don't have uh, uh, an incredible expertise in um, you know, press books, so we wouldn't be able to do that for you, but we know that Pressbook takes in HTML, Word, uh, and things like that, so we can provide you the source documents for that. And if it's something really, really out there, um, you can always send us the files, actually, for right now for uh, Virginia Tech. Uh, Corinne, who um, was one of your uh, guest speakers, is, has tasked us with looking into a file that originates in FrameMaker, uh, which is, yeah, it's, it's kind of an uh, old... Uh, um, program um, and right now we're like just chipping away at it trying to see how we can get the very best content out of it so that way we can um, get this into a more you know recent and current um, uh, format so uh, depends on on what you need but um, as long as you talk to us beforehand and say like hey you know I want to go here and this is what I have we can tell you um, what the best way to do it. And even if we can't do it, um, we can at least give you some answers to, to the question. So we're always looking for that. Yeah, and just to, to follow up on what Elvis said, if the source file is in design, um, we can certainly look into that and get it out into a well-formed uh, format. Um, as for how easy or difficult that is, it really depends on each and every InDesign file is its own unique um, uh, set of challenges depending on how the original user set it up. So we would have to give you a case by case sort of assessment there. Yeah. Um, Ellie and Larry's questions remind me of a few points that I think um, could be helpful. And so I don't know if we've already covered this, but just to be totally clear, Scribe is not a publisher. They're a publishing services provider. So they're here to support your publishing program. Yes. Um, and their process, um, one of the reasons that I really appreciate it is that accessibility is built into it. We've had um, another colleague talk about accessibility in the past. I don't know if you, either of you would like to say a little bit more about why the well-formed document workflow is, you know, has that accessibility built in and how you guys um, work to make accessible files. Sure. Um, Mike, I don't know if you want to go first. 
Yeah. Okay. So um, by default, because our um, markup language is based on XML, um, we it's already uh, accessible. It can already be taken into certain screen readers and things like that. Um, but on top of that, because we know accessibility is important, uh, we've actually included, included certain, for example, styles. If you look in that scribe uh, markup language list that um, Mike sh shared a little bit earlier, um, we actually have styles that are, for example, uh, emphasis when, you know, rather than say, for example, italic and everything's italic, uh, we know that screen readers can't really tell that apart. So we have different styles that if you say we need this to be accessible, we will apply those styles uh, to your um, to your documents. We have that. We have um, alt text um, that can carry throughout the entire production um, a process. So for example, if you have the alt text for all of your images, we can include that and you will have that in the SCML, in the ebook, in the Mobi, um, and in the PDF. Um, let's see if there are uh, a couple other things like we, for example, work with uh, NIMAC uh, to produce uh, NIMAS files for other clients. So uh, we have familiarity with just getting things approved by N NIMAC for, uh, you know, um, uh, for their um, ingestion into their system. So, um, so yeah, so we have expertise in, in accessibility and we're always looking to sort of make it even more accessible because the, our sort of philosophy, if, if you remember, is that whole idea of front loading. And we think if like we make things accessible from the get go, then we're not really, it's like accessible, I believe, I forget her name, but um, in the presentation that we've done in the past, it's like if something is accessible, it's like if you make good design, it's going to be accessible uh, um, regardless. So like good design takes into account that not everybody, for example, um, you know, can see all the colors or can see it all and so on and so on and so forth. So, um, so yeah, so we have accessibility essentially built in. I don't know if Mike wants to add anything else to that. He's shaking his head no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, Scribe's workflow is based in Word, and so if you're wondering, you know, how can we have editable files for adapters or people who want to make changes, they do make the Word files available mm -hmm. um, so that future authors can work in Word, which, as you know, many faculty authors do, or they can import one of the other file types into a different publishing platform. Um, as mentioned, Stephanie has been working in Pressbooks, and so they're, you know, they're kind of moving between those, those um, tools. All right, we have two minutes remaining, so I think this is our time to wrap up. If you have lingering questions or something we didn't get to today, um, please post them in the share document, and Mike and Elvis can take a look and answer them, especially if you have something really technical, um, or a particular project that you're thinking about, um, please let us know. And if you have questions for me um, in the vein of Paige's question about, well, how does this work with the consortia or with the co-op, I'm always happy to answer those. Um, otherwise, we will meet again for our last meeting. I'm already getting sentimental uh, <laughs> next Wednesday when uh, Liz Mays will join us from Pressbooks. She's gonna talk a little bit about ISBNs, printing, and Pressbooks. So these two last meetings are um, introductions to different publishing pathways that we can support for you in the OTN. Working with Scribe we will have um, future trainings in 2020 on working with Scribe, if you want to think about that. And we'll have future trainings in 2020 about working with Pressbooks, if you want to think about that. And then down the line, it'll probably be another path or two. So that's where we're going here. We're transitioning from the general Pub 101 publishing information to more specific production, publishing platform type information, and then we can continue to support your learning um, in, in those pathways. All right, everybody, thank you for being here and see you next week. Thank you, everyone.